All right. Okay. Thank you all for joining us on this Zoom call tonight. Of course, this is the this is the third. This is the third. Is it the fourth? No, this is the third uh, Tuesday. So we're going to be talking about the open forum. This is the open forum uh, approach, and we're looking at the Book of Revelation and fielding questions. Although I think I've got something that you all may want to discuss that comes from the book of Revelation, and then I'll, I'll field whatever other questions that you all might have. But before we get started on any of that, um, I would like to open us up in a word of prayer, and I'm going to ask if there's someone that would quickly grab the mic and lead us into prayer, and then we will move forward. So who would like to do that for us tonight? And of course, if there's no one, I'll be happy to do it myself. This is the part where everybody fights for the mic. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight, Father God, for your grace and your mercy throughout this day to give us this time, Father God, to study your word together. We ask, Father God, that you give us the understanding and the wisdom as we go through your word. And Father, bring forth revelation knowledge through your spirit. So we thank you for each person that's on this line, each person who wished to be on this line tonight and could not. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, thank you and amen. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah. Love the enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, folks. So this is what we're going to do. Um, I thought I would start us off with um, some calming uh, spiritual music before coming in really hot tonight. <laughs> so uh, we're going to be looking into a part of the book of Revelation that... Maybe we've talked a little bit about it. I know at one point we did talk about uh, the beast and the demonic and your authority, but kind of reviewing some of the things or thinking about some of the things that I covered this past Sunday, I thought this would be a good place for us to look at uh, Revelation chapter 18. And um, so what we'll do is I will bring up Revelation chapter 18, and um, we've looked through just about every one of these chapters. They're all very, very significant, and um, if there's anyone that would like to see some of the prior things covered, we have those on the YouTube page of Christian Fire Assembly, and um, anyway, it can be located there. So today, I want to open up chapter 18 and take a kind of deep dive into a particular aspect of um, of where we are today and the kind of spiritual wickedness that is being embraced is a very good thing but it is this is where i get in trouble but it is spiritually wicked <laughs> so here we are revelation chapter 18 and looking at the first verse, and I'm going to read down uh, to a certain place and then I'll stop. But chapter 18, verse 1, it says, And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lighted with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, and 
uh, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works in the cup which she hath filled full fill fill to her double now i just want to hold it right here there's there's more that i can read here i think it's 23 verses in this chapter 24 verses all right but i'm going to stop right here because um this might be the place where we can begin to take a deep dive um but before i talk does anybody have something right out the gate that you'd like to say about this, something that you've noticed about what we've read right here, and and then I'll move forward. So if, um, if there's anyone that would just like to say something about this right now, um, here's the opportunity. And of course, I will present several opportunities for us to be very interactive. But I'll say, uh, yes. I'm a, I'm a little confused because it sounds kind of contradictory. It's like, don't hang out with her, don't consort with her, but then reward her double. So I'm just kind of confused about that. Are you thinking of reward in a positive or a negative? Oh, yeah. Perception is everything. <laughs> <laughs> Does that clear up the confusion? Uh, yeah, that's helpful. Okay. So it's a negative reward, y'all. It's not It's not a good thing. God's not saying, I'm just going to reward you for all. I'm going to give you some good stuff for all your evil. <laughs> no, that's not what he's okay, talking Okay, so about. basically <laughs> everything that she's doing evilly, you do good. Yes. Gotcha. The, the Bible says it this way. Unless somebody wants to say it before I do, what does God say he has for the, well, for the just and the wicked? The ring? He has a reward. Oh, okay. He will reward you the according ring to. The just and the unjust. Yes. <laughs> so he will reward you according to your works. Yeah. And if your works are wicked, you receive the reward of the wicked. If your reward, if your work is good, <laughs> you receive the reward of the good. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Pastor? Yes. What I'm seeing is that the whole entire world has fallen drunk with evil. Her fornication, we we've in other words entangled ourselves or the world has entangled itself with her in that state of fornication which is totally against what God wants and going to hold us all responsible for that, that have partaken. It says for all nations have drunk of the wine. Yes. So, so it's not some, but all. Oh. That, that's deep. <laughs> right yeah. there. Oh. That, that got me right there. Just that word, all nations have drunk of the wine and the wrath of her fornication. We've all partaken of that. Yes. Why we got to repent. <laughs> anyway, yeah. that's what I got. Okay. Well, that makes more, that makes sense because I mean, if you're fornicating with someone, you're taking, it's a spiritual exchange. So you're kind of taking on their likeness. And once you have that exchange, it can be very difficult to unentangle yourself. So it's almost like they've made this allowance for to be on, I don't know, one accord with Satan. And now they're just drunk and they can't like, they're blinded. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Other observations? I was thinking about uh, the prayer that we're praying a lot now. Uh, Second Chronicles seven fourteen. That's what I was thinking about. Turn from the wickedness, humble ourselves, and seek the Lord. Yes. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face 
and turn from their wicked way. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Yes, that's Second Chronicles 7, 14. But it seems like with this particular group of people, they're a reprobate mind and God has just allowed them to continue in that state while he's warning us, hey, don't be like them. Stand strong, stand firm in what you believe in. And when the devil's trying to come against you, you come against him. Yes. And what's so amazing with that is that what you just said is that here's another angel or another voice coming from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Like he's warning us, come out of whatever you've been drunken with, whatever, whoever you fornicated with, come out of it. And there is, to me, a, a salvation or what am I trying to say? There is a deliverance. There's a place where we can get out still. At this point, <laughs> I mean, if, he's, if he's taking the time to call you out, that means you're redeemable. <laughs> like, Amen. Like, you know, people, that's just he's like, you know what? Hands off! I'm gonna turn. I'm gonna let you turn yourself into a beast. Uh, so mm. yeah, it's like okay, if he's calling you, you've still got a chance and you've still got an opportunity to hear his voice. Because when you're just a reprobate mind, you can't even hear anymore. You're just so deep in it. It's just like it's really no hope. Yes. Is he not talking to the churches at this point, too? Say that again. Is he? It look like he's talking to the churches. So all the the churches have, that have fallen into this trap. Well, you see where I've got that in really big type in green. My people. <laughs> My people. So, what do you all think? <laughs> I think some people are his and some people are not, and he's making a distinction. Yes. Yeah, he's calling for us, us and he's calling uh, his I'm people. He's referring to like governments and cities and things like that. So. so now it's very interesting, the language here about fornication, about habitation of devils, foul spirit, and unclean and hateful bird. I'm going to say... To some degree, um, this is this is um, addressing a an, an area that we are dealing with right now. That's what I'm going to say. I think this is addressing an area that we are dealing with right now, and it comes down to when it talks about in terms of her fornication. Nations are drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And Babylon is this great, Babylon is, um, was the city that was trying to reach out and, and establish its own way to God. And that's why in the original Babylon, when they were building the tower, God said, I'm going to come down, I'm going to confuse the languages, and we're going to end this effort. We're going to stop this. Then there was another Babylon that belonged to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was who God used to go uh, after a rebellious people in Israel and carried them away in captivity. So there are these these uh, analogies that we draw from to get a handle on Babylon. But it's the it's the mindset and it's the control of this city which has which has its global reach because it's called Babylon the Great's fallen fallen and all the nations seem to be associated with it somehow. So there is that aspect, but here's what I want to really begin to nail. And this may just be part of the problem, but I want to I want to feature this, I'm not saying it's the only problem, but I want to feature this. And when it talks about the fornication, fornication, and all the nations have drunk the wine of this wrath. And it says in verse 6, reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto double her, double unto her, double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. Now, here's an interesting thing. <laughs> That God doesn't bring the judgment until a cup of iniquity is filled. 
So right now, it's still being filled. <laughs> Think about that for a second. It's like God is saying, we're just going to wait till this sin has so filled the cup, it starts to run over. So what we're looking at right now in the earth, one of the things that we're dealing with um, is this sexual rebellion against God, which seems to have started in a corner, but now it is moving across the entire earth. And we're looking at this, this LGBTQ phenomena of which at one time during the 80s, we would say this is only 2% of the population, maybe 2.5%. But they present themselves like they're 20% of the population. And everything that you look at, no matter where you turn in media, in politics, in entertainment, in athletics, in academics, no matter where you go, it is there, and it has presented itself to such a degree, the mindset of people globally is that this is normal behavior, with the exception of some places, as I had said in Africa, like, you can keep that. <laughs> you can keep all of that stuff. Don't bring that over here. But the pressure is on for everyone everywhere to conform to this. Muslim nations... Um, they are they are still fighting against this uh, in the Jewish culture. They are not readily re accepting this, but in every culture there is this this pushback coming from the LGBTQ to adopt it, and it's being fueled by the devil. It is being fueled by the powers, the principalities, and the rulers of the darkness. The rulers of the darkness. And so I, I wanted to bring this out because we might not be living everywhere, but we are living in the United States right now that is beginning to feel the press of this, even to the degree that um, in the 80s, when it was first considered very, very unusual for any of the LGBTQ to be um, ordained in the ministry, now it's becoming very, very common. It's becoming more and more accepted. And you may have heard that the Anglican Church uh, now is becoming more aggressive about accepting the LGBTQ perspective of spirituality and uh, many other places. Um, I'll just come back to America. Many places are finding they're being pressured to accept this. And what we're going to have to do, and the reason I'm bringing it up, is the argument is coming toward you. And how are you going to begin to address this, especially when these issues become more and more complex? When people are not just saying, I'm involved in homosexuality, but now they're saying, I am changing my sex. As a matter of fact, there's, there's, biblical, there's biblical support for changing sex. There's biblical support for being a homosexual. There's biblical support for being a Christian and being gay. When people come at you with that kind of argument, like the Bible allows for it, the Bible is endorsing this, how do you respond to that? What Bible are they reading? <laughs> what was that? I said, what Bible are they reading? Exactly. Oh you and my daughter were saying that at the same time. Like, I, need, I need receipts. Can you point to me where this is so I can help you see why you're wrong? <laughs> okay, great. So, I'm bringing this up so that we at least understand the argument that is heading our way. It's heading our way, and people are going to say that your perspective of looking at the scripture is from a hate perspective, because Jesus never said any, this is their argument, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. So if they say that, 
how would you respond? And I'm saying it here because this is going to become an even more global issue. And God is recognized. God sees it. And this is part of this. Uh, I think that when he's talking about Babylon, the great has fallen, has fallen, has become a habitation of devils. I want us to understand that the in the in. I want to say the infestation of the demonic is not just happening in a little place over here and a little place over there. It is everywhere. It is everywhere. And it's across nations. And the community that seems to have embraced their difference, they don't realize how far away from the image of God they have placed themselves. And if we say that we love them, we genuinely care about them, we can't approach a conversation with them being only slightly aware of what we need to say or slightly aware where they're coming from. So uh, to, to one extent, I believe that we need to be sharp enough in the scriptures that we can deal with all of their pushback that they say is coming from scripture, but on the other hand, we need to be anointed enough that if people begin to show that they're breaking, we can pray for them and we can even take them through some form of deliverance that might happen on the spot or it might be progressive. But people need to understand that one of the key arguments that that all of these different groups are using is that I was born like this. I was born this way. Folks, the basic argument to address that is certainly. Let's agree you were born that way. So was I. I was born in sin. I was born in whatever um, a misappropriation of the, the free will that I have. I was born a certain way, just like you're born the way that you were born. But here's the deal. You can be born again. <laughs> you know, so I will give them that, even though there is absolutely no science that validates that. And that's another thing that we need to understand, appreciate that even the scientists that have looked into this. And I can give you some very specific studies that were done out of John Hopkins University um, and the and the research is peer reviewed, which means that. Those that are in the scientific and medical community have looked at the research, studied it, and have vetted it. And they're saying there is no scientific justification for anyone ever saying there is some kind of chromosomal or gene structure that pushes me in a direction of being homosexual. It does not exist. So I just wanted to say that much as well. But coming back to the, the biblical and, and, oh, yes, yes, let's do this. What do you say? This is just to challenge us a little bit. What do you say when people want to come here and you'll say, well, there's very clear instruction that we see in the Old Testament that says uh, verse 21 and Luke 18. And, and trust me, the gay community is kind of armed to have an argument. And it's a weak one. It's a weak one. Let me just say it's a weak one. But they're going to try to come with it. An argument that says this does not apply. Le uh, Leviticus 18 does not apply. Okay, but here it is. Thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire of Moloch. That deals with abortion, too. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast or defile thyself. Uh, neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there unto. It is confusion. Defile not yourselves in any of these things, for in all these things the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you, and the land is defiled, therefore do I visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Now I could read further, but there, when you start reading 
where it says there how um, you shall not approach any that is near of kin, and all of this sexual activity that is outlawed, they will say, well, that doesn't apply to us anymore. If you hear that, what do you think your response should be? Romans one twenty seven. <laughs> okay. We can go to Romans 127, which is very, very good. But before we leave this, is there anything that you could say concerning this in, in Leviticus to, to help them to see they're not, they're not applying honest scholarship to this? That God doesn't change. That's very true. That's very true. Here's one of the arguments that they will say. Well, this is the Old Testament, and there's things that, and they'll say, well, I'm a Christian. Of course, they'll say that. Um, but even if they're not a Christian, Christian, they'll say, well, Christians are being taught not to use anything in the Old Testament anymore because that's all under the law. What I'm going to say to you all is there's the moral law, there's the civil law, and then there's the ceremonial laws. All ceremonial laws are fulfilled in Jesus. All the ceremonial laws, the priests, the burning of incense, the, the, the uh, sacrifices that are made, and then they have to wash, and they go into the holy place and into the most holy place to sprinkle the blood. All the ceremonial laws are fulfilled in Jesus. All of the cultural laws were peculiar to the culture, but even they had a prophetic meaning to them. And I'll show you one in a minute. But when it comes to the moral law, just plain and simple, God does not change his perspective of morality. He does not change. The scripture says, for the New Testament believer, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But for the Old Testament believer, our Old Testament argument, we can go to Malachi chapter 3. And I'll do that for us very quickly. Malachi 3. And it says in verse 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. He doesn't change. <laughs> and so... So I'm going to throw these things out here now. What else would you like to say? And Ricky, you can go back to Romans if you like, but that is a foundation that we work from. And even what is written in Romans is based on what is said in Leviticus 18, 19, and 20. But say on, sir. Let's, let's, let's uh, hear what you got to say there. Also, uh, Christ said that, he says, um, I came to fulfill the law. I didn't come to do away with it. And later on, there's a scripture that says, no, not one jot, not one tittle of the law will pass away till all things have been fulfilled. So we, he confirmed it. And it was confirmed by Christ by his own words. And it was confirmed by the disciples later that he didn't do away with the law. Amen. Amen. All right. I think also, um, depending on who you're speaking with, the first question would have to be, do you believe that the Bible is of God? Do you believe God is real? Because hmm, there are these arguments that we have. And if they don't have a perception of believing that God is real or his word is real, then how do you fight that argument? Well, basically, for anyone that says that they are an unbeliever, um, you might you you will probably have to approach this differently because the honest truth is, folks, when we get into any kind of um, discussion or debate with people that are convinced that this is normal behavior, it's it's just a matter of planting some seeds, knowing that. Everything that you say may be rejected, but yet you plant the seed anyway, and you do it in a way to which your presentation of it cannot be construed by any reasonable person that you're not coming with hate. Because trust me, there have been Christians 
that when they're dealing with the LGBTQ community, they have protested, they have raised signs that said, uh, God hates LGBTQ people and God wants to send all gays and homosexuals to hell. So, you've got the gay and homosexual community that had to deal with that kind of animosity coming from people that are, quote, Christians, unquote. And we, if we're going to engage with them, we have to show them that is not representative of the, of the love of Jesus at all. It's not. And, and, and only we, in our conversations, and our demeanor, and our temperance, and the anointing that's on us can begin to show them something different. Because all of these words that we will plant, they may be coming with animosity, but we cannot return that animosity with animosity. The scripture says, do not overcome uh, evil with evil, but overcome evil with good, right? Yes. That has got to be our, our mode of operation. And if someone will hear they will hear. And even if they won't hear, you've planted something and you pray over the things that you've said. But the key thing that I just wanted to do tonight is let us know this conversation, this confrontation is heading straight for us. And they feel that they're armed with scripture. And you just plainly, if you don't even know anything of scripture, you, <laughs> the one thing you can say is, be honest with the scriptures. Just be honest with the scriptures because this is a misrepresentation of the scriptures. This is misrepresentative. This is not, here's a key thing, this is not consistent. This is not contiguous. This is, this is misappropriated content. So the content, the consistency, and the congruence of all these things as, as far as the LGBTQ's argument to support their behavior by by the Bible is a horrible argument, but they're going to try it, and they're going to try it against people that may not know any better. And so the consistency of Scripture cannot be denied. The patterns of Scripture cannot be denied, and they will twist, and they will even twist. Romans chapter 1, as far as they can, but there's certain things they cannot twist about Romans chapter 1. So, Amen. I've said, I've said quite a bit here. Somebody else want to say something as I'm, I'm going to Romans chapter 1 for a moment? Okay, <laughs> I'll just say this. Look at, okay, um... I'm going to ask Ricky, where would you like me to start reading, Ricky, or, or you, um, probably 18. Probably 18? Okay, here we go. 18. For the wrath of God, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Last week, we talked about how that, to, to some degree, it's very easy to see hypocrites. Hypocrites can hold the Bible or hold biblical tenets, and because of their hypocrisy, they can say they hold it, but they hold it in unrighteousness. But the point of the scripture is not necessarily just dealing with that. It's dealing with the fact that deep down on the inside of every person that is saying that I'm an agnostic or I'm an atheist or I just don't believe it. I don't believe that there's a God or whatever. Everyone, everyone, this word here, hold, who hold the truth, that hold, that word is suppressing. There are people that are suppressing the truth and they're doing it so much on purpose that they begin to believe their own lie that there is no God. But the, deep down on the inside, where their spirit is, where their spirit is, their spirit will say there is a God. Yeah, but their yeah. head will say there's no God. There's no God. Like the Bible says in a couple of places in Psalms, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Well, that's a fool. 
uh, you know, that's not wisdom speaking at all. The wisdom of God will cause somebody to have the fear of God. But there's no fear in these people. And, of course, what we're talking about here is with the agnostic and the atheist all the way to the religious person that's doing wicked stuff but yet says, I believe the Bible. The scripture says there are those that suppress, they push down the truth, and, and they want to keep it suppressed because they can't face the real call of truth on their life. They can't face the fact that there's a God. So they got to say everything against it. They got to suppress that truth and cover it with a lie and hope that the lie will hold. And they believe their own lie. So anyway, uh, verse 19, because that which may be known of God uh, is manifest in them. Like I said, every man has a spirit. Every man can look around. If, there, if everyone got away from the scientists and the philosophers, and they could just look out at everything that's made, they would have to say, somebody did this. This didn't just happen. Right. Someone did this. Someone powerful did this. So anyway, it's manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without what? Excuse. Amen. Without <laughs> excuse. So there is that, you know. It says, because that... When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And again, you'll have people that are gay Christians, homosexual Christians, they're not Christians if they are that, they're not following Jesus, that they're doing is... They're, they're saying they're part of the church. They may be part of a, a an organization called the church, but it isn't the ecclesiastes. It isn't the ones that are called out from unrighteousness to righteousness. They're not, they're not part of that. They're something else. But they're saying they're just like us. But, um, but yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. In in that they have they have rewritten their own Bible and called it the Queen and ja Queen James version of the Bible that they want to refute you on what you're saying. This is not the Bible. Either. Yeah, you know that also says, and all of these things that I'm saying, who uh, for us, who is the final word on everything? It's God, right? God we call we call that position of authority. We call that being sovereign. There is none above you. Amen. <laughs> There's none above so you for so God is sovereign. When people will do things like that and create their own Bible because it's based on their um it's just based on what they think and their emotions and how they feel and this is what they want. They have replaced the sovereignty of God and they become their own sovereign. And that might be something you actually say to people, that you are placing the sovereign with you being sovereign. And that's where this but, is I mean, That just doesn't make sense because it weakens your argument. Because if your whole argument is that God is with this and God supports it, you wouldn't need any type of extraneous documentation or books or anything like that to support your argument. It would be fully supportable or supported by the Bible itself, if that is your argument. Exactly. You're undermining your own argument by creating separate extraneous mm -hmm. documents. One that is cherry picked information, yeah. hand picked information, I mean, it's severely desired crazy. information, and now this is going to be the new authority. Yes, the argument is stupid. <laughs> I just wanted to say it. You said it. Yeah, what you do with people where they are, where, they're, they're, where they are. But go ahead, Ricky, what you were saying. That wasn't me. I didn't say it. But... <laughs> I, I agree with you. it, but it wasn't me. <laughs> What was that? Oh, okay, right. Okay. Yeah. I agree with it, though. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you wanted to say about that, Rob? No, that was it. I just had, uh, I, re I had remembered that I had seen it, and uh, 
I went back to look it up because I remembered uh, having a conversation with an agnostic and a gay uh, individual, LGBTQ, the alphabet people. I can't remember all of them alphabets. Uh, and that was one of the things I got. And one of the things I, I have noticed with speaking to people who say, I don't believe in God or I don't know what to believe in. Uh, my question is, how are you so knowledgeable about him if you can tell me you don't believe in him? Right. Yeah. Well, that's uh, a good point is, Pastor, you remember back in the day when it was mentioned that some scientists that were trying, studying the Bible to try to prove it wrong. And by the time that they had gotten finished reading the Bible, they became Christian. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> There are a number of people with that testimony, scientists, lawyers, every walk of life. Why do you want to show lawyers in there? Lawyers, you know, because <laughs> lawyers, that's okay. They present a good argument. <laughs> oh my gosh, Dang. I could say janitors and no, uh, no, you were very lawyers very are very, smart. very smart. Yeah, no. So sometimes they're too smart. I think the words you're looking for are logical and analytical. Okay, <laughs> let's <laughs> use that. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but regardless, from every walk of I'm just life, joking, everyone. I'm just... <laughs> from every walk of life, just like you said, Jesse, there are people that have set out to disprove the Bible. As a matter of fact, the reason that one of the reasons why I said a lawyer is because one of the lawyers that was with, um, oh, let me see, it was back in the Nixon administration. I think it was Charles Colson. I don't even know if Charles Colson is still alive, but uh, he was one that had determined to prove that the Bible is flawed. And, and there was someone else, Lee Strobel, um, he, he, he was also along that path of trying to disprove the Bible. And both of them ended up saying it's true. Yeah, <laughs> it's right. Well. Charles Colson. What is it? Former White House counsel. Yeah. Died in 2012. Okay. Yes. So, um, so they became believers. So yes, that happens. Scientists, so many different people. So I didn't want it to just restrict it to the scientists, but plenty of scientists have sought out to debunk, to debunk the validity of the Bible, and ended up saying Jesus. Save me. <laughs> there you go. Now, what, is it somebody right on the screen here? I mean, I'm getting some extra stuff written on the screen. I'm, I'm, I don't know where that's coming from. I, I don't know how. <laughs> yeah. I'm sharing the screen, and there's some extra stuff being written on here that maybe needs to be erased. Do people have access to it? Yeah. yeah. I, I give everybody free freedom to use the screen. Oh, no. I didn't know that. <laughs> Yours is the only one being projected. Yeah, I probably went wrong there. <laughs> okay. But, um, but, but uh, anything else anybody want to say about, oh, I didn't finish reading, but is there anything else somebody wants to say right now? Mm -hmm. This is good. Okay. I think you uh, said it all on Sunday. You are really, you are really on it. Uh, Two weeks ago, my coworker called me. He's, uh, you know, thinking he's gay. Yes. And then Monday, another one of our coworkers called, and she's a lesbian. And I'm like, oh, here we go. Here we go. And, and so it's like, she was like, I really miss you a lot. Well, it's not me that she misses. It's Jesus in me. So I'm like, Amen. okay, Lord, let me continue to show forth the love because they had. They didn't have to call me, you know. So, you, you, the Lord is moving tonight. To God be the glory. And the reason again we're doing this is so that you have, your, your armed to be able to have, let's say, an intelligent, an honest, <laughs> intelligent conversation with somebody that wants to present these things. And um, if they're going to try to use Romans against you. It's very hard for them to, to overcome what it says here in verse uh, 24. Well, let me, let me pick up where I was reading. Let's go back up here. Uh, verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain 
in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You're running to people to say, we're just animals. No, we're not. We are not, and God isn't an animal, and God created each human being in his image. And so we're not to be on the level of an animal. Like some people will want to believe that all created beings are the same. We need to respect them all. And it becomes a ridiculous argument to where that can go, um, that people will to kill a baby, but they will uh, spare a bird that fell in their yard and take care of it and nurse it. Crazy understandings that people have. So, uh, so it can be extreme where people are on this. Verse 24, wherefore God also gave, uh, gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections. Let me move this up. Vile affections for even their women. And it's very specific. Their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Why, what, so when somebody says, what do you mean against nature? Let's go back to the very beginning of Genesis. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. God created after I had done everything that he needed to do. He created man in his own image. And then from man, he withdrew something out of the man. And then he made a woman so that the woman and the man would be together, that they would be naturally mated. That's very natural. You maybe think that we can do things unnatural and still call it natural. It is not. And the Bible wants you to know there is a way that you can do something that is against nature. It is possible for you to do that. If everything was good and God didn't care, this would not be written. And if you feel that this was just written by a quote-unquote misogynist man who has a misunderstanding about humanity and femininity and all that, you got to remember that the man that wrote this, let me see this, come back up here. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Who did this? It was God that called this man. It's Jesus that appointed this man. We can go back to the book of Acts and see where he appointed him. So don't go thinking this is just somebody that's got it all wrong when they are bringing you the word of God and you don't have the, the desire to believe it. And if there was any fear of God in you, you would at least consider it. If there was any fear at all. But if there's no fear of God, then you're going to be given up to your own deception. This is what the scripture says. It says, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature and to be clear, and likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one towards another. Even uh, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and received to themselves that recompense of their error, which was meet or suitable. And, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, because they're pushing it down, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, forn fornication, that word fornication is pornea, and pornea is, yeah, maybe we need to take a deep dive on that word, just 
you can appreciate it. Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers. They say they're Christians, but everything that they would do if they're of that community is breaking the, com the, the covenant, is breaking it. Covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. God's laying it all out here because when we began this in verse 18, it says, for the wrath of God. So what is God doing in his mercy? In his mercy, he's sending out people like me and you in, at different times to engage this community in the spirit of love to tell them the truth because if they continue down the road that they are going, being willfully, willfully rebellious against clear written instruction, uh, instruction. They are setting themselves up to be their own sovereign, and Jesus will not save that person as they have put themselves in his shoes. So let's see if you can save yourself. You can write your own Bible. Can you save your own self? So these are the things that, that are written here. And I said I want to go to this word fornication because it's a it's a it's a pretty deep word. Um let me see. I've got we are not created for premarital sex. And in the Roman Empire, all of these kinds of things that we're reading about here, this was happening during the days of Jesus and Paul. And, and I've got written here, if you can see my notes, it says many injustices were being broadly accepted as societal norms, slavery, forced relocation of people from their native lands, gladiators, governmental corruption, homosexuality, it was there, idol worship, gluttony, incest, fornication, and adultery, just to name a few, and could have also said away with abortion too. But these things were there, but I wanted to deal with this pornea. The New Testament word is pornea, which is pornea. The word is translated whoredom, fornication, idolatry. It means a surrendering of sexual purity. And right down here, I've got highlighted sexual immorality is the selling off of sexual purity. And why is it such a problem? It comes back to what we were reading there in Leviticus chapter 18, because the Torah is the only place where you find <laughs> sexual immorality defined. And one of the things that God said is when people want to bring up, well, there's the custom laws, there's the ceremonial laws, there's the moral laws. We don't need to respond to any of those laws anymore. Well, here's what God says. He says, you are not to engage in the activities found in the land of Egypt where you used to live. And this is a different translation from the King James Version. Uh, in the activities found in the land of Egypt where you used to live, you are not to engage in the activities found in the land of Canaan. And then you continue reading on in Leviticus, and, and, and one of the things that it says there is that when you do it, the land will spew you out. And what we're reading there in Revelation chapter 18, when the cup of iniquity is being filled, and, and, uh, and, and Babylon has become the habitation of devils, and uh, every unclean bird, and uh, fornication, it's like God is saying, I'm filling up this cup so that your very world is going to begin to revolt against you because of this. That's kind of where this is coming from, that the, whole, the earth is going to begin to revoke the, uh, the presence of these people that are continuing to defile it. And the key thing about understanding fornication, what is the opposite of being holy? If marriage and a woman and a man come together in natural use to enjoy each other, 
They get they have all the right in the world to enjoy each other and to continue to be fruitful. But the opposite of holy is profane, is to defile, is to pollute, and is to desecrate. In the Hebrew, the word is profane. The opposite of holy is profane. So no matter how you look at this, this behavior about changing the use and um, being forbidden from practicing these um, same-sex attraction acts, or even going through the process of changing your sexuality and becoming um, a transgender individual, all of these profane, they defile, they pollute, they desecrate the person. So whether the person is homosexual or whether he's just some guy, like I used to be, that just wanted to be sexually active, it's profane, it's defiling, it's polluting, and it's desecrating. So it's not like homosexuals have the corner market on that which is profane. Lots and lots of people are participating in profane things that turn the holiness of God, the sacredness of sex, into something that is that is to be abhorred. So I just wanted to say that much. Yes, sir. Um, this is Ruth. Um, yes. In looking at a lot of the commentaries, when I look for the scriptures, it seems like even in the commentaries, they don't even want to talk against the, the things that God is saying in his word. Like they're saying things like, well, is um, homosexuality really wrong? What does the Bible say? And it seems like they're smoothing it over. I do know that, or I believe I remembered that having a 501c3 now might be difficult for some churches because they have to let in the LGBTQ, all the alphabets, into yes. the community of the church, or they could suffer some type of wrath from the 501c3 not being able to keep it. I'm not sure if that's real or not, but I think that's what I read a while back. And so a lot of churches I'm seeing, I'm even watching people, I'm not mentioning any names because I'm not doing that, but pastors <laughs> that have at one point, you know, was saying one thing and now they're saying, look, we embrace everybody and we're not going to say anything. And, and I'm going, wait a minute. <laughs> That's yes. not what you said two or three years ago. So I don't know where exactly it's coming from, but I do need some real, I need some scriptures. I got some people that I am praying for without ceasing. My knee pads are wearing out, but not my heart. And so I'm going to continue to pray. If I wake up in the middle of the night four or five times, I just do it. But I'm just telling you, they're real close in my circle and they are running from me. They don't want to hear from me. <laughs> and I understand it. But all I do is love them. And all I do is I keep talking positive things about love. But I haven't gotten that door open yet. And I'm, I need to be fortified before that door is open because I don't want it slammed in my face yet. <laughs> it may be, but I need to be able to plant the seed, as you said. Right, right. Key thing for everyone to understand here, I mean, everyone, is no matter how um, how proficient you are in the scriptures or how little you know about the scriptures, the one thing that you do when you engage these people is, you, is you're constantly wanting to show them you're saying whatever you're saying in love. You're not coming at them with the hostility that they've had to endure from, let's just say, less gracious Christians. We at least need to understand that the power of love can trigger things from the Holy Ghost to give us what we need to say in the moment we're saying it. So there is that aspect, which is why I said it's one thing for us to be um, secure and understanding the scriptures and, you know, really beefing up on knowing what the word of God has to say about these things. But if we find ourselves being brought into a conversation and we haven't really had a chance to get into all the scriptures that we want, trust God. <laughs> 
Trust God. Just know that your position is absolutely solid in the word, and God will give you the backup. Amen. Oh, yes, he will. Yes. He definitely will give you the backup. Yeah. I just want to go to one more place. Oh, yeah, we're a little beyond the time. But I want to go to one more place here where Paul talked specifically about this. In my notes on the left side, you see that I brought up rabbinical and Judaism, uh, positions of Judaism and what the rabbis have said, and they don't endorse this behavior at all. They've always spoken against it. And that's for people that will say that, well, this whole concept of homosexuality was brought in, and they'll say something ridiculous like, uh, 1942 or 1950 where Christians brought it in. This stuff goes all the way back into the rabbinical writings of how they viewed the sexuality of men and women and not even coming close, men not coming close to other men or women not coming close to other women having these kinds of sexual um, encounters. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. But here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This is 1 Corinthians 6, 5, 6, 9, rather. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, pornea, which covers that whole spectrum. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And one of the reasons why I wanted to come here is to do this little bit right here, and then we're going to conclude. Um, if I can, let me see, where is that? No, that's not it. Uh, oh, here we go. Text comparison. This is uh, 6 9. Yes. Look at this. this is, these are the different translations now. Um, 6 8, uh, 6 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So that's King James. In this translation, which is the living, uh, do you not know the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither sexual immorality, nor people who are idolaters or adulterers, nor passive homosexual partners, nor dominant homosexual partners. That is another translation. In the King James Version, the new King James Version, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. The King James Version, the older version, seems like it's, it's telling you, but these newer versions just coming right on out with it. Like this, this uh, the Amplified is talking about homosexuality, the ESV, those who pr practice homosexuality. Uh, it just, I'm just telling you, it's plainly stated here in Scripture. Amen. There is no argument that they can, they can successfully wage against somebody that knows what is written. That's what I'm saying. But it is a real thing that we have to deal with. The people really do need to know that if they want to begin seriously making a change, one, they weren't born the way that they were. They can be born again. Two, if they struggle, they can have whatever spirit that has plagued them their lifetime or however long it's been there. That spirit, that spirit can be silenced and removed. So <clears throat> that's what I want to say about those things. As we come back to where we were. And for all of us understanding what's going on, there's a great fall that's coming. The habitations of devils are just building. And this cup is being filled right now. So, that's all I'll say about that for now. It's 841. We're beyond our normal time, but I guess before I conclude this, does anyone else like to say something? Would you like to say something before we conclude? I have one question, Pastor. Yes. Uh, 
since God himself gave these people over to a reprobate mind, how difficult is now has it become now to convince these people that God loves them and back to salvation? Does that make that harder or does it make it just as normal? Because it is God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That's, you know, it's kind of like, hmm. Am I going against God by trying to save this person now? I don't think you're going. Okay, I can answer that part pretty easily. I don't believe we're going against God. And the, and the way that you'll know that you're going against God is when God says, stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, told, he told Jeremiah, in the 11th chapter of Jeremiah, Israel was going so far down a hole that Jeremiah was praying for them, repenting on their behalf. And then God just said, stop. I'm weary with repentance. So don't even pray for him anymore. So I would say until you get that red signal from God, continue. Because you never know in the midst of the people that may have a deep, deep, um, thick crust of hardness over their heart and their mind, there might be calcified, there may be somebody that is in their company that has a crack and you can put a seed in there and it may grow and prosper and they'll be free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm right now I'm seeing, uh, I was actually watching some videos today about that same thing that so many were told when they were younger, yes, go ahead and go through this transition. Now, two or three years later, they are regretting it. They don't know how to change. Some of them are being uh, are, are starting to get suicidal thoughts. They would rather be dead than have to go through the things they have been going through. Some of these young men that have made transitions are getting sick, and they're coming up with diseases that uh, that shouldn't be on people in their age. So um, there's there, there's a really nasty source starting to grow in their lives because of the decisions they have made. You see, and, you know, and these people, they seem like they're so far gone, but in reality, now they're even crying for help even a lot more. Right. Than they right. This is the dark underbelly that the alphabet community and those that support it don't want you to hear. And like you said, for those that have, this has been a, this, this transitioning and trans, uh, uh, transgender operations and, and um, hormonal treatments and um, all these kind of things have been in play for the last 20 years. So you know the studies have begun to come forward saying that when people after about five years, between five to 15 years after doing this, it could be shorter, but between five and 15 years, they start having deep regret and they want to change. They want out. So th this is what's being disclosed. 41% of these people, like you had said, 41% of these people want to commit suicide. Mm. This is the dark underbelly that, you know, the media, all the people with the platforms, they're not talking about. You know the group that is really holding the standard and, and wanting to bring the truth? You already know the answer to that. There's only one group. <laughs> that's, the, that's the body of Christ. <laughs> we want to engage. We want to help. We want to pray. So that's what we'll do. And the fullness, the full manifestation of that, I believe, is right here in chapter 18 of Revelation. And I guess we'll just conclude on that. So, Amen. So would someone like to close us in a word of prayer? I do. Father, thank you very much. Father, we just glorify your holy name. Thank you for this gathering that we've had today, Father. And thank you, Lord, for giving, for giving us the opportunity to come together as one body to learn from the words that you have given our pastor, to enlighten our minds, yes. to understand what's going on in this world right now, Lord, because there's just so much confusion, uh, so much lies that the enemy is just throwing out to the people. And the people are receiving this with such ignorance because they don't know you. 
And it is our job to try to enlighten them with the truth. Father, give us the ability, the, the, the right words, the knowledge, the understanding that we can have ourselves to be able to communicate to these people out there that are in need. We ask you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, because you're coming. It's right around the corner, and we know this, and we see this. We see all these changes around us, Father, and we need to be prepared and have as many people around us prepared for your coming. Also, Lord, give us the strength, knowledge, and thank you, Father, once again for this opportunity that we have all had to come together to glorify you and honor you, yes. Father, by your teaching. Thank you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 All right, folks. Well, I hope this has been fruitful. Yes, it has been. been wonderful. Yes, it has. All right. Oh, yes. Okay, folks. Well, look forward to see you all this weekend. And um, prayerfully, if you do find yourself engaged in a conversation with any of these folks, God will give you what to say. And the anointing will be on you. If deliverance is needed, you can bring the captives out of their captivity into freedom. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, folks. Amen. God bless. God bless. Thank, Thank you. Good night, saints. <laughs>